delve into the harrowing tale of Anita Lorraine Cobby, a young nurse whose life was tragically cut short in 1986. This investigative video explores the grim events surrounding her abduction, assault, and murder, shedding light on the heinous crime that shook Australia. Uncover the twists and turns of the case, the pursuit of justice, and the enduring impact it has left on society. Anita Cobby was someone whose calling in life had been to help others. A nurse by trade, the former beauty pageant winner always made sure that her patients were tended to with the utmost care. For the people whose lives she touched, she had been nothing short of an angel on earth. Born in Sydney, Australia on November 2, 1959, little Anita Lorraine Lynch was the apple of her parents' eye right from the start. Growing up, she had proudly told anyone who would listen that someday she would be a nurse just like her mother. It was a call from which she would never waver. After graduating from secondary school, Anita had enrolled in a nursing program at Sydney Hospital. In 1981, she met and fell in love with a fellow student named John Cobby whose easy smile and gentle ways had swept her off her feet. A year later, they were married in a modest ceremony attended by a small group of family and friends. Although they had tried their best to make the relationship work, three years into the union, the couple separated. Having come to the difficult realization that they were no longer on the same page, they decided to put the marriage on hold, at least temporarily. After spending some time apart, it began to dawn on Anita and John that they were better together. By the winter of 1986, they were slowly working toward a reconciliation. With the flame that had started to fade now rekindled, the couple were once again looking toward the future. Unfortunately, the happy ever after the envision was not to be. On Sunday, February 2, 1986, the last day of her life, Anita had spent the afternoon fulfilling her duties at Sydney Hospital. At the end of her shift, she had accompanied a group of co-workers to a local restaurant for a bite to eat. At that time, Anita was living with her parents, Gary and Grace, Peg, Lynch while she and John worked on mending their relationship. After getting a lift to the railway station, she had boarded a train bound for Blacktown, the Sydney suburb where her parents' house was located. After disembarking at the Blacktown station around 10 o'clock, Anita had planned on phoning her father and asking him to pick her up. In a tragic bit of bad luck, she found that none of the pay phones were in working order that night. To add to her plight, the taxis that were usually on hand were all in use. With no other options to speak of, Anita had set out on foot for what should have been a relatively short walk to her parents' house. As she started down a quiet residential street, Anita had no way of knowing that she was about to cross paths with the worst that society had to offer. As the young nurse was making her way home, a group of career criminals happened to be joyriding in the vicinity of Blacktown Station in a car they had just stolen. The men, five of them in total, were well known to local authorities as mean-spirited troublemakers. Their ringleader, 19-year-old John Travers, was reputedly a sexual deviant who took great pleasure in torturing and abusing anyone or anything weaker than himself, including animals. All in all, they were an unsavory element that no woman walking alone would want to encounter. After cruising around for a while, the men noticed that the gas gauge was hovering near empty. Without a dollar between them, they decided that they needed to rob someone before the tank ran dry. Unfortunately for Anita, she had rounded the corner just as they were passing. As soon as they laid eyes on her, they knew that they had found their mark. Upon spying the pretty brunette, they had abandoned their initial plan for something far more sinister. After pulling up beside her, two of the men jumped out and grabbed her. Taken completely by surprise, she had screamed and struggled to break free. Alerted by Anita's cries for help, a teenage brother and sister who lived nearby had bolted out the door in time to see a group of men forcing a clearly terrified woman into a vehicle. In a remarkable display of courage, the boy had yelled for them to let her go as he charged in their direction. Undeterred by the attention they were drawing, Anita's abductors shoved her into the back seat before jumping in the car and speeding off into the night. The teenagers had briefly given chase but gave up when the taillights disappeared from sight. While the sibling's mother was on the phone with police, her eldest son pulled into the driveway. 
After hearing what had taken place and knowing that time was of the essence, he had gone in search of the woman who the family believed was in grave danger. Shortly after setting out, he spotted a car matching the description he had been given parked on the side of the road in a rural area of Prospect, some six minutes from Blacktown. Hoping to rescue the woman before she came to harm, he had gotten out and shown a flashlight into the vehicle but found that it was empty. After having a look around and seeing no signs of anyone in distress, he assumed that he had the wrong car. Not knowing where to go from there, he had reluctantly abandoned the chase and gone home. The young man would later learn that he had indeed found the right car. What's more, the individuals he was looking for had been lying motionless only a few feet away in the weeds that grew thigh high around the roadway. In order to keep her quiet, Anita had been pinned to the ground with her mouth covered to stifle her screams. Her abductor's luck had been in that night, to be sure. Unfortunately, hers had not. When they were certain that the coast was clear, Travers and his gang had taken Anita to a nearby field. In the 90 minutes that followed, the five of them had taken turns beating, torturing and raping the woman who had, up till then, believed that people were inherently good. Once they were sated, the gravity of the situation began to sink in. As a brutalized, but still conscious Anita lay face down in the grass, her assailants openly discussed what to do with her now that she had served her purpose. It was Travers who had ended the debate by saying that, since she had seen their faces, she would have to die. Egged on by the others, he had grabbed her by the hair and jerked her head back before slitting her throat. The act had been so violent that she was nearly decapitated. Without a shred of concern for their victim, the group of thieves turned murderers returned to their stolen car and fled the scene. As careless as they were cruel, they had made no effort to conceal Anita's remains, leaving her in plain view in the paddock where she had spent her final moments. After driving to the house where Travers was staying, the men had collected Anita's belongings from the car, including her purse and clothing, and burned them in a backyard incinerator. Though they didn't know it at the time, the next-door neighbor had been watching them through a window. She would later tell authorities that the items they destroyed had emitted a sickening odor that was like nothing she had ever smelled before. Back in Blacktown, unaware of what had transpired, Anita's parents were beginning to wonder what was keeping their daughter. By then, it was well past eleven and she should have been home hours ago. While it wasn't unheard of for her to stay over with friends after a night out, they were a bit concerned that she hadn't called to let them know, which wasn't like her. Though there had been no reason to believe that his daughter was on her way, Gary had felt compelled to look out the window one last time before retiring to bed. As he stared into the darkness, he hadn't seen Anita as he had hoped, but he had observed something that had sent shivers running down his spine. Gazing up at the night sky, he had noticed an odd formation of clouds slowly passing in front of the moon. As he continued to watch, the clouds merged, creating a monstrous-looking face. In that moment, he knew that something terrible had happened to Anita. Gary Lynch likened the phenomena to seeing the forces of good and evil converging right before his eyes. As his entire being was overcome by a horrible sense of dread, he knew that his life was never going to be the same. In a bizarre coincidence, miles away in Sydney, Lynn Bradshaw's peaceful slumbers were interrupted by a voice she recognized as belonging to her dear friend and fellow nurse, Anita Cobby. In this strange dream state, the women had briefly engaged in small talk before an exhausted Lynn suggested that they continue the conversation in the morning when they arrive for their shift. Anita replied that she wouldn't be returning to work. The last thing she said was, I won't be there. I'm dying. With those ominous words still ringing in her ears, Lynn had awakened to find herself in a cold sweat. Even as she tried to rationalize the episode as having been a dream and nothing more, she had known instinctively that the encounter had somehow been real. Glancing at the bedside clock, she noted that it was just after 11. When the details of her friend's fate were later revealed, she would learn that Anita's estimated time of death had been between 11 and 11.30. The following day, when Anita's family were informed that she hadn't shown up at the hospital as scheduled, they made a beeline to the police station and reported her missing. 24 hours later, a farmer noticed that his cattle were congregated in one spot, apparently mesmerized by something lying in the middle of the pasture. When he went to see what had captured their attention, he stumbled upon the battered body of a woman, 
her hands still clutching the grass. When he called the police, officers were quickly dispatched to see if the victim and their missing person were one and the same. After identifying Anita's distinctive wedding band, the case was handed over to the homicide division. In their search for the killer, detectives focused on the most likely suspect, her estranged husband John. After grilling him relentlessly, they had broken his spirit to such a degree that he made a full confession. Days later, when physical evidence emerged that pointed to the involvement of multiple perpetrators, none of them John, his prior admissions were thrown out and he was cleared of suspicion. The investigation took on a life of its own when morning radio host got hold of a copy of Anita's autopsy report and read it live on air. Among other things, the coroner's findings revealed that her hands and arms were covered in defensive wounds, one of her ears had been severed, her nose and both cheekbones were broken, and she had been raped numerous times by more than one offender. After learning the extent of her suffering, horrified listeners were prepared to find her killers themselves and tear them limb from limb. With details of the horrific crime now public knowledge, leads poured in from citizens eager to help find the monsters who had committed such dastardly acts. Several tipsters mentioned a group of car thieves who were always wreaking havoc on others. The name John Travers, in particular, had come up time and again. On February 21st, Travers and his associates Michael Murdoch and Les Murphy were brought in for questioning not in relation to Anita's murder but for the alleged car theft. While Travers was taken into custody pending further charges, the other two were released later that day. Shortly after his arrest, Travers had phoned a relative and asked her to bring him some cigarettes. Little did he know that the simple request would end up giving detectives what they needed to solve Anita's murder. After delivering the cigarettes, the woman had spent a good while conversing with Travers. By the time she left, she was convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that he had been instrumental in the abduction, rape and murder of Anita Cobby. Determined to do the right thing, she had gone straight to the detectives working the case and told them that Travers had confessed to the killing and had even named his accomplices. Although they believed that she was being truthful, investigators knew that they needed to hear the story in Travers' own words. In order to accomplish this, they asked her to go back in and get him to repeat the entire conversation, only this time, it would be caught on tape. The woman, who was as appalled by the heinous nature of the crime as everyone else, agreed to be fitted with a recording device on her next visit. When the time came, with very little prompting from her, Travers had offered a blow-by-blow -blow account of what occurred on February 2nd. When detectives listened to the playback, they were disgusted at the way the killer had paused every so often to chuckle as he went over every gory detail of what he and his cohorts, his old friend Michael Murdoch and brothers Gary, Michael, and Les Murphy had done to their helpless victim. When he was finished reliving the events of that night, which he had clearly taken great pleasure in, he warned his visitor to keep her mouth shut or the same thing would happen to her. Upon learning that the law was onto them thanks to Travers, the Murphy brothers attempted to flee the area. Fortunately, detectives were one step ahead of them. Having set up roadblocks around the areas they were known to frequent, authorities picked them up, one by one. On the day of his arrest, Gary Murphy had taken off when he saw squad cars approaching the residence where he was hiding. As he fled out the back door, he was tackled by officers who were in no mood for his nonsense. While he was being led away in handcuffs, it was noted that the 28-year-old wannabe gangster had wet his pants. 18-year-old Michael Murdoch, a friend of Travers since childhood, was also taken into custody during the roundup. Exactly 22 days had passed between the discovery of Anita's body and the apprehension of the last of the men believed to be responsible for her murder. As is typically the case when more than one person is accused of being involved in a serious crime, the suspects had quickly turned on each other. The only thing they seemed to agree on was that Travers had been the one who had ended Anita's life. After being confronted with his taped confession, rather than going through the motions of a trial, the leader of the pack of lowlifes had pleaded guilty to all charges. He is currently serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole at the Wellington Correctional Centre in Wooloman, Australia. During the court proceedings that began on March 16, 1987, Travers' sidekicks had made no effort to hide their contempt, even as the judge and a roomful of spectators looked on. As the charges against them were being read aloud, they had talked among themselves and laughed at the absurdity of it all. 
On June 10th, the four defendants were declared guilty as charged and ordered to spend the rest of their natural lives behind bars. From the time of their arrests to this very day, not one of them has shown remorse for their crimes or an ounce of sympathy for their victim. In 2019, 66-year-old Michael Murphy died after a lengthy battle with liver cancer. That same year, his brother Gary was jumped in the shower by a group of his fellow inmates who proceeded to beat him senseless. Although he survived the attack, the injuries he sustained had sent him to the hospital in critical condition. John Cobby eventually remarried, but that union ended in divorce. For decades after Anita's murder, he blamed himself for not being there to protect her. Anita's father was never able to fully come to terms with what he had witnessed in the sky on the night his eldest daughter was snatched from this world. Though there's no way of knowing if there was a hidden meaning behind the disturbing phenomena, the more spiritual among us might suggest that the moon, which had shone brightly that night, represented Anita, all the menacing clouds that joined together to eclipse that light were indicative of the men who had taken her life. Few would deny that his description of the clouds as having been foreboding and evil could easily be applied to Travers and his co-conspirators. Gary Lynch died in September of 2008 at the age of 90 from the effects of Alzheimer's disease. Anita's mother Grace joined him on July 1, 2013. After spending over 20 years without their beloved daughter, they were together again at last. As we conclude this haunting narrative, we are reminded that the memory of Anita Lorraine Cobby lives on, forever etched in the annals of Australian crime history. May this story serve as a beacon of hope, urging us to remain vigilant in our pursuit of justice and compassion for the victims and their families. Let us honor Anita's memory by standing together against darkness, ensuring that her legacy remains a catalyst for positive change in our society.